thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to the Net Patient Foundation, Kathy, and everybody involved for inviting me. Uh, I've been a consultant in Southampton for just under 10 years. And uh, when I first arrived as a liver and pancreatic surgeon, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, they, they were just about on my radar, but they weren't something I was expecting to spend as much of my time involved with as I currently do. Um, so, first of all, what to expect from liver and pancreatic surgery? First thing I think you should be expecting is a specialist service. I think you should also expect a team approach. There should be a range of treatment options that are discussed with you and that you are, have offered to you. For patients with localized disease, then I think early surgery is a high priority. But for patients with more advanced disease, I think an aggressive approach that includes surgery should also be considered. I'm going to talk a little bit about the centralization of pancreatic surgery, which happened uh, over the course of the last decade. It would always be nice to have every bit of treatment that's offered to you immediately on your doorstep, but the reality is that there was a widespread acknowledgement that complex surgical techniques such as are required for pancreatic surgery are done better if they're done in centers doing lots of it rather than done by people just doing it occasionally. So if you've got a pancreatic primary tumor and you need surgery, you're gonna end up being treated in a center that serves a regional population between two and four million. And that's uh, based on central guidance and although it was directed primarily at ordinary types of pancreatic cancer, uh, it covers all types of pancreatic tumor, uh, including neuroendocrine tumors. The reasons for centralizing, uh, there's a lot of difficult venous anatomy around the pancreas. If we, uh, all of those various pipes and tubes normally run through the pancreas, I've removed half of the pancreas in that patient, and normally that red outline would be superimposed on all the veins. So it's important to know your way around the veins, and it's important to know your way around the arteries as well, because there's a lot of arteries that run through and around the pancreas. So it's these kind of technical reasons that mean that your surgery is best done if you're having pancreatic surgery by somebody who does a lot of it, because familiarity really is the key. And you know, I look at that picture and that's like walking into my front room. Um, that's, that's home from home. So um, team approach. I mentioned that a team approach is important and it's been mentioned already that really the key to managing neuroendocrine tumors successfully is not to just be focused on a single pathway, it's to have all of the relevant specialists in discussing you because they're such complex tumors that there, there aren't many people for whom there's a simple set pathway that can be followed. For the majority of people, what we end up doing is really producing a bespoke pathway, something that's tailored to you. And so I think you need to have your disease managed by a specialist center uh, with a multidisciplinary team specializing in neuroendocrine tumors. And there's just dozens and dozens of different people that can be involved depending on your pattern of disease. As treatment options have already been um, discussed, so you've already heard about somatostatin analogs. Uh, occasionally patients get interferon, biological and cytotoxic chemotherapy. The biologicals are the everolimus and uh, the sinitinibs and cytotoxics as discussed. Uh, radionuclide therapy. We haven't talked much about embolization or chemoembolization or CERTEX. These are techniques that block off the blood supply to tumors in the liver. Uh, ablation uh, is burning tumors or freezing tumors inside the liver. And then there's surgery, which is uh, clearly the thing that I'm gonna be talking a little bit about. Um, this is a picture of somebody who's had some embolization. If you're looking at the picture on the left, you can see there's a, a blush, a sort of potato-shaped thing, and that was a tumor probably about the size of a medium King Edward. And particles are used, introduced through the arteries, going all the way up in a fine catheter from the groin through the arteries, up into the arteries inside the liver, and they're released, and they block off the blood flow to the tumors. A lot of neuroendocrine tumors have a very, very rich arterial supply. So if you block off their blood supply, they can shrink dramatically. Ablation involves uh, 
directing probes into the liver itself and into the tumors and then either warming them up with microwaves or radio frequency energy uh, or occasionally cooling them down and that again can destroy tumors by uh, changing their temperature and either effectively cooking them or freezing them. I've mentioned advanced disease and it's not easy to have a definition as such um, but in general terms they come in two groups so advanced disease can be a primary tumor i.e. where the tumor started that's not treatable using the conventional criteria that would apply to ordinary tumors in the pancreas or liver and that might be due to its size or the site of the tumor or its involvement of other organs or vital structures such as blood vessels uh, metastatic disease that means secondary disease or spread of the disease so if it's spread to lymph glands a long way away from the original primary site or it's sp spread to other organs then that would be termed as metastatic secondary disease and those are both examples of advanced disease in neuroendocrine tumors there's a number of groups of advanced disease that involve a surgeon with liver and pancreatic surgical skills. Intestinal tumors occasionally spread right back along those blood vessels that were shown on the pictures earlier. And so sometimes I get involved in removing tumors from the, what's known as the root of the mesentery, which is basically the root of the bowel where all the pipe work and blood vessels come out. Um, we also deal with patients who've got peritoneal disease and desmoplasia. Now what on earth is that I hear you thinking? Well, peritoneal disease is tumor on the lining of the tummy, and desmoplasia is plaques of thickened fibrous tissue that you get around neuroendocrine tumors. I also deal with advanced pancreatic primary tumors and patients with secondary disease in the liver. Now, you've heard about aggressive surgery perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm not, I've, I've actually put this picture in here because some of my patients think that I look a little bit like Boris Johnson. <laughs> and I'm just trying to quash that because clearly I look nothing like him at all. Um, I'm not a conservative surgeon. Um, I'll talk a little bit about non-surgical management. Some patients are unfit and surgery just isn't going to be an option for them come what may. There are some patients who have very small tumors that are found by chance. They're not causing them any symptoms. They're at one end of their, their lives where, to be honest, the chance of that tumor causing them bother in their natural lifespan is too small for it to be worth treating. We also see patients who have liver disease, but it's in many, many little dots and spread all around inside the liver. And then surgery is not going to be of any value there. Or sometimes if you've got spread to many other parts outside of the tummy, then again, we might back off from thinking of surgery. One of the things that um, you all need to know about with your tumours, for those of you who've got them, um, is the proliferation index, sometimes talked about as the CHI-67 or MIB-1 index. And they all mean the same thing really, which is what proportion of the tumour cells are growing at any one time. So this is a report that's given by the uh, pathologist when he's looked down the microscope and he sees what percentage of your cells in your tumor are in a growth phase at any one stage. And that's given as a percentage. Um, it's very often very low, such as less than 1%. And that means really that 99% of the cells in your tumor are inactive at that time, um, and they're not actively growing. So the tumor will only grow very, very slowly if only 1% of its cells at any one time are in a growth phase. In ordinary types of cancer, um, typically we see growth rates of 70 or 100 percent. So if you're down at the 1 percent end, that's very, very different uh, from the types of tumor that respond uh, much better sometimes to conventional types of chemotherapy. But it does mean that your cancer is in slow motion. Uh, the majority of patients with neuroendocrine tumors, their proliferation index is somewhere between less than one and up to around about 15 or 20 percent. A small number have higher grade neuroendocrine tumors and they're managed much more similarly to conventional cancers. Another reason for not having an operation is you don't want one and uh, <laughs> can't argue with that. Well, I do argue, but. Um, aggressive surgery. So this is more how I like to think of my, no, it's not. This is, um, 
aggressive surgery, what, what do we mean by aggressive surgery? We don't mean that we're um, recklessly slashing away just because it's fun. Um, uh, we're little fluffy bunnies, really, aggressive surgeons. But we are operating on advanced primary disease. Um, we're operating on secondary disease. And we're also operating preemptively. So uh, not waiting till you've got a disastrous problem. But if we see something that's going to be a problem, we try and deal with it before it is. Um, fluffy little bunnies never hurt anybody, did they? Well, anyway. Um, so the surgical decision in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is it technically possible? Now, uh, we have to look in a different way at neuroendocrine tumors because they are in slow motion. Um, so yes, again, we look at the size of the tumor, we look at the site of the tumors, and we look at the involvement of blood vessels and other adjacent organs. But there's also a big holistic decision that needs to be made because patients aren't just uh, a set of scans. So yes, we have to say, can all the disease be removed surgically? Or if you can't remove it all, can you remove most? Or can you remove the important bits? You have to weigh up the risks of the treatment against the risks of not treating. And what are the benefits of the treatment? You have to look at all the treatment options and say, what's the most effective single treatment? Which area of disease is the most dangerous if left? What does the patient want? What's the impact on the quality of life? And if you're going to do more than one treatment, what's the most effective combination and in what order? The pattern of the disease, the proliferation index, these are key things again. So it's not just about looking at the scans and saying, yes, technically I think I can do that. I can remove that lump or that bit. It's putting it all together. And that's why it takes a big team to come up with a complex decision. Sometimes just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. But equally, just because it's difficult, it doesn't mean you shouldn't. That's me a few years ago. <laughs> well, maybe not me. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about multimodal cytoreduction. And that's a technique of using different types of treatment in combination or in sequence to reduce the number of viable cancer cells in a patient to the maximum extent. And it's something that I'm a, a great believer in. It's all part of a multidisciplinary strategy. So it involves all the different team members, as shown before. But the cytoreduction element of it involves surgeons of a hepatobiliary and pancreatic nature, such as myself, bowel surgeons. Sometimes we work in conjunction with uh, surgeons who specialize in operations on the blood vessels or on the chest or on the kidneys and bladder. Uh, also, cytoreduction involves nuclear medicine physicians, oncologists, and interventional radiology, with all that ablation and embolization business that I was referring to earlier. So what are the aims? The aims really are to get control of the disease at an early stage and using the most effective treatments early, rather than using the big guns at the very end stage of a disease, if you use them early on, you'll probably get bigger and better results. Preemptively targeting critically placed disease, sequential treatments that reduce the risk, so rather than trying to do everything all in one go, uh, splitting things up, and aiming to maximize the potential to receive the greatest range of treatments. My aim is to find that my patients um, haven't just been managed with one, one single line throughout the course of their disease. I try and use things, and we try and use things in sequence to maximize their effect. So phase one of multimodality cytoreduction is all about achieving control. And we often start by placing patients um, on depo-octreotide somatostatin analogs to control any carcinoid syndrome, and also because it's got an effect reducing the rate of your proliferation. We often do laparoscopies, putting a telescope inside the tummy and take biopsies to assess the disease and to be sure we know the proliferation index. Then sometimes we'll start by embolizing uh, tumors in the liver to reduce the volume of disease. Then do surgery to remove the primary, then further surgery to move other larger secondary deposits from the liver, then further TACE, which is chemoembolization, so it's embolization with chemo in to the remaining liver disease. Now that's one sort of example, and that's what I often say to my patients is the difficult first year. 
because if you have all of that thrown at you over the course of a year, it's a lot of hard work. But the aim is to try and get rid of 90 plus percent of your disease. Sometimes we can get rid of all visible disease. We won't cure you if it's already spread, but we will be able to get on top of it. And then you're into the secondary phase, which is surveillance, where you're, we're watching for any new trouble. Um, you'll have your depot octreotide still. You'll be on regular surveillance with uh, chromogranin tests, sometimes fasting gut hormone profiles or 24-hour urine tests. So we'll be looking at the markers of activity of your disease that we can measure in blood or urine. We'll have regular scans and we'll be cherry picking anything that crops up. So it's a lot easier once you've got control to just pick out small things as they arise. And that can be either with further surgery, ablation, or embolization or other treatments. Phase three is maintaining control. And so this is as you're further along, you've had more problems and you're targeting treatment again specifically to further sites of recurrence. Usually doesn't involve more surgery. Sometimes we dish out something known as Sirtex at this stage, which is a, an embolic uh, treatment, so blocking off blood vessels in the liver, uh, but with radioactive particles. And you're also more likely at this stage to have systemic therapy, so treatments of the chemo nature, which can either be with the biological agents like Everolimus and Sinitinib, or with more conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy, and also more likely to have radionucleotide therapy. So why on earth do you want to go through all that? If you do nothing, um, then the average survival for secondary and spread neuroendocrine tumours isn't that great. And you've all heard that neuroendocrine tumours are good tumours and they're well behaved. So really, to be honest, if they're well behaved, um, you'd expect to be doing a bit better than that because we can achieve that in bad cancer. Um, there's been various studies which have shown that drugs such as octreotide uh, can reduce the rate of tumour progression. And it's probably worth having a look at these slides later on when on, on the web. But basically you can shift the, the curve to the right and um, make a dramatic increase in your time to progression by just by having octreotide on its own. And if you add in everolimus as well as octreotide, then again, it can make a big difference for certain specific types of neuroendocrine tumor. But all of these are just adding a few months on. And we'd like to do a bit more than that. So looking at primary tumors, I think the, primary, the resectable primary should be treated surgically, which is European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society guidelines. And patients who have primary tumours in their intestine that haven't been removed are as likely to die just from local complications of the tumour as they are from secondary problems. So we have a low threshold for removing primary tumours where they can be. This is a patient, as you can see from the arrows, who's got a, a, a mid-gut tumour. So that's a small intestine tumour, which is probably one of the commonest sites of it down in the ileum. And it's quite bulky, and this uh, young lady had been having symptoms for about eight or nine years. Um, put down as irritable bowel syndrome, um, then as a sort of premature menopause, then as hysteria. Um, which, uh, does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Um, and these are her insides, and that white stuff is the desmoplasia, which is the, uh, uh, the fibrous reaction that you get around mid-gut tumours. And we removed that kind of knot of small intestine. Um, and she's doing well. Desmoplasia is that hard white fibrous material. This picture's moved in this particular uh, version of PowerPoint. Oh well. Anyway, you can see there's that little white blob down in the corner of that picture. And that's the hard white stuff that you get around these tumours sometimes. And you can actually manage to dissect it away very often from the blood vessels. Not always, but very often. And there's a range of operations that are worth doing. And they usually require a surgeon who's happy with pancreatic surgery and with the big pipes and blood vessels around there, because that's just underneath the pancreas there, and that's territory that <laughs> bowel surgeons don't normally go. So sometimes if you've had a, a tumor in the bowel that you've been told uh, isn't, isn't operable by a bowel surgeon, sometimes it needs review by a pancreatic surgeon, because uh, the difficult bit is the pipes around the pancreas. 
Um, we also see this desmoplasia, this white stuff, grow around some of the blood vessels at the back of the tummy. And the picture on the left, the arrow is pointing at a little slit-like structure, which is the inferior vena cava, which is the main blood vessel draining blood in the lower abdomen. Uh, and that's the inferior vena cava before and after it's been decompressed. And you see it's a nice big round or oval shape on the right-hand picture. We also occasionally operate on patients who've got disease in the lining of their tummy, peritoneal deposits. These are nodules of tumor that escaped or spread around the lining of the abdomen away from the primary site. And the ENETS uh, guidelines are in favor of treating this as well surgically when you can. Um, ENETS guidelines are, are quite favorable for a surgeon. They pretty much let you do anything. Um, <laughs> but I don't normally tell the physicians that. So um, not everybody who's got peritoneal disease should have an operation, not by any means at all. Um, but just occasionally it's the right thing to do. And basically there are ways and means of stripping some of that disease off. So particularly in younger patients, I'm very inclined to do that. And uh, we've done that on 14 patients. Well, it's actually 15 because I did one yesterday. Um, and uh, in general terms, we find that despite this being considered to be a very unfavorable um, thing to have, if you can strip it out, then it can actually be something that you can then live with and go for a long time with. Um, so I'm a, I'm a surgeon, but I'm also an artist, so I love this picture. Um, the, the little fine red line is something that pleases me. Um, but basically, if you're gonna do big operations, you need to see what you're doing. But you can do that as well with keyhole surgery, much smaller incisions, and you can get a fantastic view from the inside as well. So you were asked what to expect, and I'm afraid with surgery you have to make a hole somehow. So it could be a small one, or several of them, or it could be a really big one. I'm gonna talk a little bit about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, the median age, so that means the, uh, the average age, is around 55 for patients um, with pancreatic endocrine tumors means probably about nearly two-thirds of patients who get it are of working age. Um, they account supposedly for two percent of all pancreatic tumors according to the books but I think it's a fair bit more than that. Uh, an awful lot of them don't make any hormones but 60 or 70 percent of them do. An awful lot of them have also got secondary disease in the liver by the time they present. And if you don't do very much then you don't do stunningly well with them so we're all in favor of treating actively. But there is a wide spectrum of disease and behavior. The kind of, sometimes I come across patients who've been told they've got a benign cancer. Um, there isn't really such a thing. We can, I'm quite happy with the term cancer in slow motion, but the vast majority of neuroendocrine tumors, although they may be behaving in a very, very slow fashion, they still have a malignant or cancerous potential or are behaving like true cancers. Um, but because they behave very slowly very often, that gives us multiple treatment options. And as I've said before, if you really want to maximize uh, long-term survival and benefit, then that multidisciplinary strategy is, I think, the best way forward. So there can be a number of indications for having an operation on your pancreas. It can be diagnostic or staging, so looking out and uh, identifying where the disease is and what the proliferation index is. We sometimes operate for cure. If you've got, just got a small tumor that's in one place that hasn't spread, then we'll remove that, and then you've got a good chance of being cured. We'll also operate preemptively for critically placed disease next to big blood vessels. Um, if you look at the picture on the top there, um, there's a, um, a couple of big pipes that you can see, bright pipes, and then there's a, a big rounded lump next to them. So that is starting to block off some of those pipes rather than wait till the patient's really got bad symptoms, it's better to just get on and do it. Cytoreduction, as I've said, trying to reduce the volume of viable cells is important. And occasionally we also do palliative surgery for patients where they've got a specific set of symptoms from a specific lump or blockage, and we're just operating to deal with that specific problem. So, surgery for primary pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. If the tumor that you've got is resectable by conventional criteria that would be applied to an ordinary type of cancer of the pancreas, then you should certainly have it removed. 
as the chance of cure is high, surgical risk is low, and that's basically UKI NETS guidelines. Um, now, not everybody still will have an operation for a primary tumour in their pancreas because um, it won't always be operable by conventional criteria, not by any means. But there is a proportion of patients with small tumours who are presenting at the right end of their lifespan where early intervention is worthwhile. If your tumour doesn't meet conventional criteria, then it needs to be reassessed by a specialist unit with an interest in neuroendocrine tumours. So that whitish blob that you can see in the lower picture, that is the desmoplasia around a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumour, just a small one, um, probably two, three centimetres in diameter. Um, and that's, that's relatively easy. There's many, many different uh, operations that can be done. Um, but in general, if you can get rid of a localised small neuroendocrine tumour, um, then you've got a really good chance of being alive and cured five years and more down the line. But the majority of neuroendocrine tumours are a bit bigger by the time we see them. However, because they're tumours that are slightly in slow motion, um, I think they're still resectable in very often, despite major involvement of the blood vessels, invasion of adjacent organs, uh, or secondaries. There's some evidence out there. Uh, there are three papers that are um, referenced here, all of which describe uh, aggressive surgical techniques. So that's not the <laughs> aggression. It's, um, it's trying your hardest to um, aggressively reduce as much tumour as you can within the abdomen. Um, and by taking a, uh, a proactive surgical approach, so um, there are papers in there that have inspired uh, our approach in Southampton. So yes, we'll look for uh, curative resection, even in patients with um, liver metastases, secondaries in the liver. If you've only got a small number of secondaries and they're localized to one part of the liver, then removing them does give you a statistical chance of being cured, somewhere around 30%, depending on the type of tumor. But we also do palliative resections to control syndrome. The less tumour you've got, then the less tumour you've got making hormones if you're suffering from carcinoid syndrome. It reduces mass effect. Um, so if you can't eat because you've got a big bulk of tumour sat on your stomach, if you remove that big bulk of tumour, then you'll be able to eat better. Uh, occasionally we see patients who've got pain because the liver is being stretched by tumours within it. And just occasionally we see patients who've bled into their tumours, but that's not really very common at all. And the other reason for operating on liver tumours is cytoreduction. Again, good old ENETS guidelines um, from 2009 give support for that. If you can reduce somewhere around 80 plus percent of the disease, it's worth doing. Um, does it improve survival? Well, this isn't a randomised control study. This is one of those biased surgical papers that get put out saying, Clearly, surgery is better than everything else. Um, but the bottom line is that um, if you look at uh, papers across the spectrum, in general, patients undergoing resection, although they're selected because they're suitable for resection, do tend to do much better overall than patients who don't go through any surgical treatment. Uh, this is a paper from Boudreau in 2005, looking at 80 cases of patients, often with very, very advanced disease, uh, 10 of those patients rescued from um, pretty much hospice care. Uh, and yet, despite all of that, he's got nearly two thirds of them alive four years down the line. And that Karnofsky performance scores mean 65 pre-op, 85 post-op. Doesn't mean very much to you, but it's basically the patients felt better after surgery. Six months after surgery, patients felt better than they did before. So you don't feel better the day after surgery, you feel much, much worse. Um, that's my fault. <laughs> but operations are good for you, I'm sure of that. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> okay, so what about the timing of surgery and localised disease? I think if you've got operable disease and you're fit, then um, early resection is mandatory. You shouldn't wait till it's grown. If you've got something that's easy to remove, you shouldn't say, oh, it's a neuroendocrine tumour, therefore let's wait until it's really big because um, that doesn't make my job any easier and it doesn't make your life any easier. 
Um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are good prognosis cancers and they should be managed as such by both surgeons and oncologists. I think it's unacceptable to adopt an expectant or palliative treatment algorithm in fit patients with operable good prognosis cancers. So if you can get rid of it, you should. You shouldn't just say it's a neuroendocrine tumor, let's not worry. What about timing of surgery in advanced disease? Well, if the disease is advanced when it's presented, it's not gonna get any easier to resect um, in general terms if it's been left to grow. There are some medical or radiological treatments that will knock the disease back and make it a bit easier, but in general terms, if the operation is difficult before, it'll still be difficult after. Surgery is actually the most effective tool for cytoreduction. And chemo and uh, radionuclide therapy, these are all means of cytoreduction. They reduce the amount of viable disease. But surgery at one swipe, well, several swipes usually, but it can reduce the volume of disease inside you sometimes by 70, 80, 90, or 100 percent. And surgery is better withstood by fit patients, so rather than waiting until you've had many, many other treatments and you're a lot weaker or have been through a lot of complications and problems, if you're going to have an operation, then you should have it early whilst you're fit and strong because you will sail through it that much better than if you have it late. Um, there's no paper that's been published demonstrating medical or radiological treatments superior to surgery. The bottom line is that if you're operable, you should have an operation for peanuts less than 20% proliferation. So let's go back to the approach we use in Southampton uh, and our team approach. So early surgery for primary disease, TACE or CERTEX, the embolization treatments for diffuse liver disease, uh, radionuclide therapy for residual or extrahepatic secondary disease, um, chemo for peanuts that are a bit faster and with residual or recurrent disease, and medical therapies as palliative salvage treatments. So if we look at our experience over the last eight years, during that time we had 64 patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, only nine had non-surgical management. Uh, 36 of the patients had secondary disease in the liver at presentation. Uh, 19 went on to have curative resections because they had really early tumors. But 36 patients had resections for advanced disease and most of my patients had additional non-surgical treatments on top, so it's, we're not one-trick ponies. Average age, mid-50s, as you'd expect, but anything from eight to in the 80s. Uh, time from diagnosis to referral, um, the average is coming down year by year by year, but when we first started, it wasn't unusual uh, for some of our patients to have waited um, two, three, four, or more years before they'd been referred to a specialist. Um, outcome, uh, no perioperative mortality, so no deaths uh, inpatient or within three months of the surgery. Uh, a lot of people do have some complications. It's quite hard work. So two out of five will have some significant problem after surgery that means that you stay in hospital longer than the average. Um, and we followed these patients up for a mean of uh, 34 months when I originally put this data together, but it's, uh, it's probably about 39 months now. Um, of those, 94% of the surgical patients are still alive, and 24 out of 55 were disease-free on their scanning. I'm not saying they're cured, but disease-free on scanning. Um, and this is a survival curve. And if you look, that curve seems to, like, come down halfway on the graph pretty quickly. And you'd say at 60 months, uh, well actually, this, this axis here uh, on the left as you're looking, it starts at 60%. So we've actually got 75% of our patients still alive. And these are patients, um, all comers with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So three quarters still alive uh, at five years plus. And what about patients with secondaries in the liver? Uh, the uncina is part of the head of the pancreas, and this is a patient with um, more than 20 secondary deposits in the liver. Uh, she presented uh, to me in about 2006, and um, we went on and unpicked her tumor from the root of the mesentery, so that 
black arrows pointing at a big blob of a lymph node. Um, that's picking it away from the blood vessels. She went on to have a Whipple's procedure, which is removing the head of the pancreas and the duodenum and the lower bile duct, and then replumbing all the ends. Um, and at the same time, we also stripped away the glands from the back of the tummy, uh, back around the major blood vessels, stripping all those sort of golf ball sized things away and preserving the blood vessels. And then we cleared everything back, all the way back to the aorta. Um, so that's uh, the first bit that came out. Um, but she was young and fit, and she wanted everything done in one go, uh, which isn't always my preference by any means. So we also took away two thirds of her liver and uh, removed all the deposits that we could see in the left side of her liver. So that was 2006, and 2009, uh, she was still disease free on scanning. Now, we've been back and we've operated on her again uh, another two times. She's had further embolization and uh, she's lined up for one more round of treatment. Um, we're debating whether, or she's debating whether to have it before or after Christmas. But she's carried on with a normal life for the vast majority of those last six years. Um, she's seen her kids get through school and uh, she's got at the moment probably 10% of the disease inside her, less than that, that she had when she f I first saw her in 2006. Um, this is another patient with liver secondaries who presented in 2011. Um, she would have what you would consider to be an operable disease by conventional criteria, but because it's neuroendocrine, there's a lot more you can do. Um, she'd had her diagnosis missed for a few years, um, and she had a big blob of disease growing inside one of the main blood vessels, which is what the arrow on the top picture is pointing to, that dark blob inside the white pipe. Um, and she had secondaries in her liver as well. I'll just give this a few seconds to work. Um, so she went on and had a keyhole operation to start with, uh, taking away the right side of her liver with all the disease deposits in the right side of her liver. And you see, bloodless surgery, isn't it? It's always like that. <laughs> well, sometimes. Sometimes always. Um, but the advantage of keyhole surgery is you can get turned around quickly, so she was home within five days. And she went on and then had that Whipple's procedure um, done another 11 days or so after that. And that's her Whipple's operation, um, demonstrating her big slab of healthy liver left up at the top. And uh, we fished all of the tumor out from the blood vessels and replumbed it. It's another patient who had had two years of indigestion and irritable bowel syndrome, and had an enormous lump of tumor filling her liver, progressive weight loss. Um, her body mass index was down to 17, so she was about 45 kilograms when she came to us, and she was really at death's door. And she had a very large pancreatic tumor and liver secondaries, and we went on and removed all of that for her. And uh, she's got other problems, but again, she's now 18 months plus out, and having been uh, absolutely a death door, um, she's still going. So multimodal cytoreduction. This makes a difference on five-year survival. Five-year survival is a pure percentage chance of still being uh, alive and kicking five years down the line. Um, if you don't want to know about these percentages, I'm sorry, but uh, they're out there. If you have an approach that involves multiple um, multiple modalities, multiple types of treatment, then you do have statistically a much higher percentage chance than if you're just um, left with um, treatments and wait until you've got a problem. And this is a study that uh, we showed at the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society and at the International Hepatopancreatic and Biliary Association this year, looking at laparoscopic liver resection as part of multimodal cytoreduction. God, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Keyhole liver surgery, that's what it's looking at. So basically, looking at those 266 patients up to 2011, or early 2012, um, 104 of them had secondaries in the liver at presentation, and we operated on 61 out of 104. And this is looking at 30 who underwent keyhole liver surgery, 
They had 33 operations between them, including some quite major operations, like that one that was shown before. They also had many, many other treatments, so it's not just liver surgery. This is about fitting the surgical bit into the whole treatment pathway, that bespoke plan for each patient. So surgery to other parts of their anatomy, somatostatin analogues like the octreotide, embolization, chemoembolization, ablation, chemotherapy. You see, chemotherapy is quite low down there, and that's because most of our patients, we're holding chemotherapy back. We're waiting till they've got real problems before they get their chemo. And this one, we've got the zero point right on the, uh, um, on the axes. So here, you can see that our predicted five-year survival is around about 80%. 83% um, from diagnosis and 80% post-surgery. And so these patients, if you cast your mind back um, to all the many other percentages, but the review by Ong et al. Uh, suggested that you should have 29% five-year survival uh, with secondary disease in the liver. And yet by having this multimodality approach, we think you can get four out of five to make it beyond five years. Um, and what about advanced primary tumours? Well, if you can resect them whilst they're small, then it's easy. Um, the blob, which you can't really see stunningly well there, but that blob there, that's um, a relatively small uh, pancreatic endocrine tumour. Um, if you leave it to grow, then um, again, you can't see it stunningly well here, can you, with the, the lights, but that big blob is all tumour, and the bright bits are where the radiologists have tried to embolize it to stop it from bleeding. Um, I don't have any pictures of the operation on that patient because the patient came over um, still bleeding and uh, it was my birthday but I still operated. But it was my present because it's my favorite operation. Um, and, uh, but I wasn't going to hang around and take pictures. So, surgical approach. So you need to involve other people um, if you're going to do complex complex advanced disease. Um, you need to really have a plan for your patients and involve all the different specialists. Um, although there are many things I can do, there are many things I can't do. And for the things I can't do or that are very difficult for me to do, I often find that I've got a surgical specialist in another field uh, who looks at it and says, well, that bit's easy, but I couldn't do your bit. And so by working as a team and planning each step in advance, and often take on things that really look way beyond um, what's possible. Um, so all of the organs inside your tummy, they all have a blood supply that comes off two pipes, the aorta and the inferior vena cava, that runs straight up and down the middle of you. And so our approach is to try and reflect organs back and get control of those pipes really early on. And I make a conscious decision early during these operations to commit and divide any structures that are in the way so that we can get control. But I don't divide veins and blood vessels until the very end um, because if you divide the veins that are draining blood out of the lump that you want to remove, if you divide them early, then the blood that's in there has got nowhere to go and they swell up like a tick. So this is somebody with a, a big lump of inoperable pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. She contacted me over the internet to donate her body to our, um, to our neuroendocrine tumor bank for research purposes, because she didn't think she had long to live. And when I first looked, I thought, you know, she's probably right. But to be honest, I like a challenge. And so I sat down with some of my colleagues and we worked out an approach. Um, so it's difficult to see with the light on, but basically this is um, the portal vein coming up here, and there's a big blob of tumour there growing into it, and this is all tumour growing out underneath the liver. And again, all of that whirly stuff up there, that's all tumour. So this is a very big tumour. It's involving the stomach, the pancreas, um, part of the duodenum. It's involving the blood vessels and involving um, the adrenal gland at the back of the tummy as well and it's wrapping around the origin of lots of these blood vessels. So we worked out a plan, reflected everything to the midline and got control of the blood vessels. You'll have to look at this online, I think. Um, and I removed the head of the pancreas, which actually had no tumor in. 
um, but that was to get control of the blood vessels and to get to the tumour. And then isolated the blood vessels that were involved. I'm sorry, you really can't see that, can you? And removed the tumour from the blood vessels and did some plumbing. Um, it wasn't me did that bit. And better out than in, the tumour removed intact. Um, so that was, uh, again, 16, 17 months ago. Um, she's doing well, uh, later scans, no convincing sign of disease. Um, so I'm not saying she's cured because I expect her to have further problems again. Um, but just because something's difficult doesn't always mean you can't do it. Um, but it does involve an extended team. And there's another big and bad one. Um, this is a patient who had been uh, turned down in a number of other centres uh, with a very large tumour involving the inferior vena cava, the aorta and the pancreas and a few other bits and pieces. Uh, we embolised it to reduce its blood supply and shrink it. Um, had a little look at it, well quite a big look actually. Uh, and it did indeed come out. Um, the picture on the top right hand corner you can't see but it's, it's all there. Um, and that guy, that was 2009 and uh, he's uh, doing a cross-channel swim <laughs> to raise some funds for us. That's not him, <laughs> but uh, it looks like what he had an attack from. Um, so in conclusion, I think advanced primary neuroendocrine tumours are often still operable, even though they're advanced. I think secondary neuroendocrine tumours are often operable, but that should be part of a multimodality cytoreductive strategy, that bespoke team approach. And I think early aggressive cytoreduction with that multimodal approach, including surgery, offers the best hope of long-term survival in advanced neuroendocrine tumours. Thank you very much.